All right, Sebastian, thanks for making the time. Uh, my pleasure. This is going to be fun. So um, I came across your work on, I, it must have been Twitter. I also think John Cumbers, when I told him about this Science Better series that I was doing, he said, you should talk to Sebastian. He'd be a good mm -hmm. person to interview. Um, and I'm glad he pointed that out because I love your vision for um, your work, but also I think your vision for what science can be. And um, I'm excited to talk to you about both of those things. Um, but I was wondering, how did you get, how did you first get involved in um, biology? What was your entry point? Sure. Oof. Um, it's, it's kind of murky because it, it just, just kind of happened after, after a while. But um, a very, very long time ago, my aunt gave me this like microscope for Christmas. And okay. it sounds like the makings of like a scientist uh, Hallmark Channel movie. Uh, but the first thing I did was I drove the objective through the slide by accident and I broke it, right? So like the very first time I touched a scientific piece of equipment, uh, I broke it, right? Um, and then after, after some like duct tape and TLC, uh, me and my mom kind of just like sat around staring at it going like, all right, what can we do with it? And uh, she remembered from her botany class way, way back. Uh, she, she was born in like the 50s in Hungary. Um, and a lot of, a lot of naturalism um, uh, happened in her, in her courses throughout, throughout her, her time in middle school and in high school. And so, so she remembered that like old fountain pen inks, uh, some of them are actually uh, microscopy stains. Right, huh. um, they're metal inks, um, and she remembered that it was like crystal violet or something like that um, was a student uh, ink in France, and she had a ton of it. Um, she had a, like a dip pen and would just like draw with it um, for her notes for school, and so she remembered that in her class they did so they took some of the inkwell ink and placed it on top of the plants, and then they saw it under uh, under their microscope. So she wanted to like kind of relive that with me, um, and I was learning about cells at the time. This was like um, I think it was about like eight maybe eight or nine something like that okay uh yeah and we were taking we were taking a, um uh in middle school it was like earth science with a little bit of life science it was kind of just like blended together they were just throwing right. facts at us um but i learned about the cell and i kind of just it just kind of blew over my head um but she she sacrificed one of her lucky bamboos her little plants uh so we could see it under the microscope and that was like the first time i saw like a textbook image like in real life and that that for me was was huge. That was a really formative experience. I didn't know until much later that that was formative, but that was the first time where the thing being taught to me was was confirmed experimentally in a way, right? And so, um, I mean, I'm obviously 2020 is in hindsight, and I'm extrapolating, but um, yeah. but that kind of set me on a path of just like kind of just general curiosity, You're like, all right, what else can I kind of verify, right? Like, right. is this real? Like, I was skeptical as a kid. Um, maybe because of like issues with authority, I don't know. But um, I was really skeptical as a kid, but uh, the science has kind of helped me um, kind of have an outlet for curiosity through time. Um, yeah. And I wasn't very good at it nor organized, but as time, as time went on, I started um, being more and more interested in plants. Um, I was propagating them traditionally. And then um, Mother's Day was coming around and yeah. I was like a couple, months, a couple months away and I wanted to get my mom an orchid, but they're way too expensive. Um, so I, I went online and, and saw, can you take an orchid cutting? And I found this entire world of plant tissue culture hobbyists who would just like take seeds from different orchids and cross them. And there's just this like really um, robust community and they shared their knowledge with me. Um, I read through their forums. Um, one of them was an old Usenet thing. I like learned how to BBS with it, but it was cool. Um, but, um, but, but case in point, I, I started getting a little bit more technical with, with, my, with my plant stuff. And uh, eventually I started like taking um, orchids that were thrown out and like at Home Depot, one of the, the, the uh, contractor stores here in the, in the US, um, they would throw, they throw out their like orchids every Wednesday, but different stores do it diff differently. But every Wednesday they would just throw out the ones that weren't flowering. Okay. And, so, and so I would just like take them from the sidewalk and I'd bring them home and I'd put them under blue light and, and plant hormones and eventually force them to flower, right? Kind of like wonky. Um, and at one point I even like started selling to them saying that they're like boutique orchids, but it was basically like taking their trash and repurposing it and selling it back, right? Wow. Um, which, was, uh, which was awesome. That, that paid for a bit, uh, put some money in my pocket and I started getting a little bit more advanced. But then once I got into... Uh, uh, once I, I got into uh, uh, university, I was able to um, stumble upon uh, plant genetic engineering, and that just like changed my entire perspective. Like it wasn't just take these two plants, cross them, and hope it works. There was like 
a bit of precision, a bit of intent. And from a, like a design perspective, from a make things with your hands perspective, um, that was huge. Like the idea of making new plants, especially right. flowers. Like I was obsessed right. with flowers. Um, and um, unfortunately, like some family and financial things happened and I had to drop out, but I wanted to continue my, my studies. Mm -hmm. And so um, the small amount of time I spent in a, in a plant lab at my university kind of like gave me a rough perspective of what I need to do. And then going forward, the next 10 years was like me hitting my head against the wall trying to make science happen, right? Yeah. Because um, all this information was like really distributed and there's no like how to for the amateur biologist, really. That's right. You know? Yeah. And so um, I became more literate, uh, like scientifically literate, and that uh, expanded my horizons a little bit more. Um, and then eventually I got a, a job, my first job at a plant, uh, um, uh, a plant startup making a self-nitrogen fixing plant, an attempt to oh, do cool. so. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, and we, it was like eight months boot camp, but that I was like a scientist reborn because all the things that I kind of, kind of vaguely understood now became very cemented in my head, right? All the techniques necessary, um, yeah. the, the pressure of a deadline, which, which was, right. which was important for me to kind of like learn how to work quickly. Um, all of those things kind of like shaped me to be more effective. But then after that, after that job was done, uh, because of my lack of a degree, I'm like, oh, okay. Um, I can't get a life science job. Right, because right. a lack of a bachelor's, you you're automatically excluded, even though you have physical physical skills, that demonstrable skills and projects that you've worked on, um, they don't really accept it. So it became this like very uphill battle of just trying to make ends meet, but also keep continuing my interest in, in biology. Okay. Um, and then and then uh, along the way, my uh, research partner Sung, uh, he started this small nonprofit called Binomica Labs, yeah. and um, invited me to do a collaboration with him. Uh, just a, an interesting side project that he was he was curious about, and that eventually turned into like a very very long like six year now long collaboration with him. And we're going to publish you know, we're going to submit to BioArchive soon. We got a new uh, bacterial genome that we just posted on GenBank. Um, all as two degreeless heathens doing uh, biology from either uh, an artist studio or the third bedroom of some guy's apartment. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and, well, so um, that's amazing. So so it's been. Um... This is it's similar to my experience where like because I, I was doing this for ocean science and ocean tech and we kind of came in through the side door you know like and it, it was always you know like not coming in through the kind of traditional path is like it makes it a lot harder but in that kind of also forces you to be resourceful and also yes. kind of yep. exposes the blind spots of the existing mm -hmm. system and like ways that it yeah. isn't um, necessarily serving as many people as it could. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, just to like get, get a gauge on like your, you, the, the timing of this, do you, like, where were you when all this like DIY bio stuff was happening like six years, 10 years um, ago, like the, the gen so, space was popping up and it was, you know, bio sure, curious. Sure. Um, so, so my research partner is actually one of the co-founders of gen space. Oh, awesome. uh, and I, and I met him, um, like this one, like really rainy, I think it was summer. Uh, and we, we were talking about protoplasts and plant, plant engineering. And he was the first person, um, not, not formally trained, but like uh, the first person that's not formally trained, but had enough competence to like, uh, to explain molecular biology to me. And this was like the first time I had inter interactions with like actual genetic engineering from a, uh, uh, from a manual perspective. Right. Mm -hmm. So like we were we were um, like colleagues in the sense of training, but he uh, he knew way more than me at that uh, um, uh, at that moment. And I was just super intrigued. I'm like, wow, a physical human being that's not a trained scientist uh, that I can learn from. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so the so I, I basically like lurked on the DIY bio forum since like 2008. And then I think my first uh, email was like in 2012. And that's actually how Sung found me. Uh, was uh, having conversations through the DOI bio forum and saying like, hey, um, I'm interested in some plant stuff. I heard you do plant stuff. Let's do plant stuff. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so, yeah, and, and, uh, uh, and he got to see like from the very, very beginning, like Jason Bob Mackenzie Cowell levels of DOI bio beginnings, right? Like mm -hmm. the very beginnings. And, um, and we had, we had like long conversations and we still do like every, every couple months we bring up the, the concept of, of how DOI bio was, where it is now, um, what does it mean? Um, mm -hmm. My, uh, both both of us have like a really kind of a we're, we're getting more and more disenchanted by the term biohacker because it was yeah, co-opted yeah, sure. by folks doing like publicity stunts essentially for sure. um and 
and yeah, and the part that was really missing was like, where was the, where's the basic research? Where's the biology, right? There's like DIY bio, but the bio stands for biology, not necessarily bioengineering, right? Mm -hmm. And so what was, what was significantly missing from my, from my experience with DIY bio is just like, who is doing research, right? And I, like, I basically like asked around, I was like, is anyone doing research? And like, everyone's doing bioengineering projects. They're trying to answer and solve problems and that's totally fine. But I was like, really interested in in just like uh, growth habits of of random weeds in the city or like has anyone isolated uh, algae that people haven't seen before um just like interesting curiosities that like have a scientific rigor attached to it not just like you know throw some gfp in there and watch it glow right mm -hmm. um and that what like essentially one thing led to another and we decided it's like okay let's um let's have a record of of amateur biologists in the modern day doing biology you know, we're definitely not the first, and there's many people doing this concurrently. It's just like they're all over in the woodworks, and we'd like to just like not like leave our mark, but leave a record to point to to say like, hey, amateur biologists can contribute meaningfully to science. Mm -hmm. And so our first project was actually um, initially it was hunting for phages of Dinococcus radiophilus, because to to this date there have been no uh, phages reported in the species, and anything that is alive has a viral component somewhere, some mm -hmm. virus attacks it, right? And so, um, uh, so Sung basically invited me saying like, hey, um, I want to look for phages. This thing hasn't been sequenced yet. Maybe we can, we could be the first to sequence this. Nan mm -hmm. At this moment, nanopore was like uh, coming into fruition. Uh, we were at like flow cell 9.4. So a couple of years ago, about two, two, three years ago. And, uh, and we said, okay, cool. It'll be a weekend project. And as soon as we heard the words weekend project, there's like distant thunder in the background, like some, mm -hmm. some, some like, like foreboding, foreshadowing, ominous presence. Um, and that weekend project turned into like a two and a half, almost three year endeavor of uh, isolating the DNA from it, uh, actually doing the sequencing. And then Sung did a, a Herculean amount of bioinformatics necessary to polish from like 16% Busco all the way to like 98%, right? With, with software. And we basically were teaching ourselves as we went, right? Um, which was the hardest part. Like the biggest learning curve was A, uh, familiarizing yourself with the Linux environment. He had way more experience than I did. And then uh, installing all of those to all of those tools, which installing sounds silly, that it'd be difficult, but it is not trivial. It's getting easier right. now with better code, but like that was an ordeal. And um, and I literally like as we were going out, I literally watched his uh, bioinformatics skills grow with every assembly that he generated, you know. And then along the, along the way, uh, tried to teach me how to do it, and I'm still very much a novice in that practice. Like he's more of a bioinformatics wizard than I am, but. Um, but in doing so, we literally saw knowledge being generated from nothing, right? Like, right. like pulling inferences, right? Because so it wasn't just sequencing something. We wanted to like have, uh, we wanted to do biology and both of our interests coalesced with plasmids, like wild plasmids. How do, how do plasmids get maintained for millions of years? How do they get swapped? Where did they come from? Mm -hmm. And if there are plasmids in uh, Dinococcus, which we proved there are um, bioinformatically, the, then maybe those came from phages. Right. So our first initial assumption was like prophage origin. Like maybe there's hints that there's some replication machinery that phages also share that are only on these plasmids in Dinococcus. Right. So this like turned into this like uh, this expansive narrative that we're still chiseling away. But we have uh, a pretty polished um, draft, essentially, that'll be on bioarchive and hopefully we'll get feedback for it. Um, but that was like the first big actual research project where like there's no hand holding, nobody knew how to crack these damn cells. Um, and then like us doing nanopore with no technical experience um, was was a challenge in and of itself, right? And I mean that that was also an incredibly formative experience. So yeah. I had the the um, uh, biotech entrepreneurship experience where I was like the solo tech of this startup company where my boss was like flying around and he's like, put these genes in a plant, go. Uh, yeah. I gotta, I gotta find money, right? So I had that experience, then I had a slightly academic experience of producing like actual research, um, and then at the same time, I was, I was really considering like, okay, I'm polishing my skills enough to kind of get uh, mildly eloquent with plant, with plant genetics, and so I said, all right, you know what? Let me try, let me try to pursue something I've always wanted to in the back of my mind, but never really had the courage to, which yeah. is to be a, to be a flower designer right, to be a molecular florist, right, like, can you generate new flowers, like, different phenotypes, for purely for aesthetic purposes, if we generate some science, and we find out um, uh, more floral developmental biology along the way, awesome, but, like, honestly, just as a, as an artistic pursuit, can genetic engineering be an artistic pursuit, can biological research be a hobby, those are, like, the two very big, um, 
umbrella questions that we have for, for our practice and along the way make it accessible and cheap. Because like the, the, the core uh, philosophy of our, of our organization essentially is called two cups and a string, which is essentially what biology can you do with trash, with the, with the world around you, with your hands and maybe just some like high precision engineered garbage, mm -hmm. right? Um, so like uh, over the years, I flipped equipment off eBay, uh, fixed it and sold it, kept the best parts for myself and then used the fancy equipment to validate the handmade tools um, and to show that basically they're comparable. And then distribute those tools for free or at cost of production. Yeah. So like the. So what are uh, what are some examples of those tools? Sure. Um. So spinning behind me is a little tube tumbler, really simple one. Um. Yeah. It it's at an axis, uh, forty five degrees across both axes. So it actually okay. does a rocking motion without changing its its movement, right? So it's basically okay. a yep. tube rocker, but it's rotating. That was a super simple build. Um. The the most um, the most promising one is actually these little mini specs. So there's these um. I stared at a spectrometer for a long time and I'm just like, okay, if we're doing bacterial stuff, we need to read at 600 nanometers. Um, why do I need the full wavelength, the full uh, spectrum, right? Why do I need to pay a thousand dollars to read a single orange light? And yeah. so I found, I found a 600 nanometer LED, a really nice light sensor and basically developed around these 15, milli, these 15 milliliter tubes that are clear that allows you to, to shake and read the bacteria at the same time, right? Without taking samples. So you can take a growth curve measurement every second uh, ad nauseum. Right. And we have some growth curves uh, in minimal media and other media that's like a month long. Right. So 86,000 data points per day times 30. Right. Um, and by looking at it second by second, which people thought was like kind of overkill, um, we actually see nuanced, um, uh, not anomalies, but nuanced features within the growth curve that um, haven't been described. Right. Or have been published as as plotted data, but have never been addressed. Right. right. And at first we thought it was noise, but like the amount of data that we've generated and the reproducibility of it essentially showed that um, these aren't these blips are actually there. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's a function of the media. Right. You can like stretch and move the blips around. And um, that ended up in a rabbit hole of figuring out how M9 minimal, minimal media was formed, like who was the first person to do it, because everyone points to Jeffrey Miller's 1972 book. But in the book, the M9 minimal media is one of the few recipes that have no referenced footnote, and he didn't invent it, right? So, so we, we did this like whole literature review for like two years on and yeah. off, just trying to find it. And eventually we found it from like a 1948 paper, not, not named M9, but the exact same recipe, right? So like it's still kind of, it's still kind of open, but um, that gave me a good experience of how, uh, how interesting and useful review articles are. Okay. And that might be one of the first uh, the papers that I want to publish for my informal PhD, which I'll explain in a bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, but essentially like doing historical lit review and then recreating some of those old experiments with modern tools as a means of educating people about biotech, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like a multi-pronged approach where not everything needs to be engineered, right? There's also yeah. like ways in which you can just take public data and there's treasure troves of, there's, we generate more data than we analyze. Right. right. So people could have access, uh, publicly available free access to like metagenomic samples from all over. And you can do real biology with just a laptop. Right. Yeah. Um, and not essentially not paying anything, like just using these public databases and scouring through it or apply machine learning if you want to. Um, but yeah, so we basically want to highlight um, all the different ways in which you can make small, thoughtful science. I love it. I love it. And so do you are. And this is all <laughs> on your GitHub page right now. Um, yeah, so mostly. yeah, so we have we have uh, our binomicalabs.org uh, yeah. web page. Um, my um, my day to day progress is in my open lab notebook, which is linked yeah. on all my social media, um, yeah. and then all the main code and hardware stuff goes on the GitHub. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. So, um, tell me about the informal PhD. Okay. Um, so, I have tried. I've, I've tried so hard um, to get back into academics, right? And um, along the way, I befriended a whole bunch of professors. I, I, I did collaborations with them, formal and informal. And uh, in doing so, I built up enough rapport that they could actually get a good character assessment, right? So they wrote some really badass letters of recommendation so I can apply to like a local school around here. Yeah. And uh, because of the family and financial reasons, my GPA took a huge plunge right at the, uh, the, the second to last semester, uh, which forced me to drop out. And because of that, my GPA was 0.01 points below the absolute cutoff for oh, considerations. No. So, so they wouldn't even read uh, recommendation letters, even though I had them from like, from like Harvard and Cooper Union and MIT. Um, 
uh, it didn't matter, right? So that felt like an unnecessary uphill battle where I'm just like, okay, um, that really sucks. I can't really get a uh, job, so I might as well put on my entrepreneur hat and not develop a product, but offer a service, right? right. So I would do consultation and startup uh, bootstrapping for biotech companies, especially like indie bio folks. Yeah. Um, like um, my consultation led me to be CSO uh, for a while for uh, Microsymbiotics, the algal salmon vaccine company. Um, oh, cool. Not too long ago, they raised a couple million. Um, that was pretty cool. Uh, I mentored the werewolf team, uh, which made uh, fluorescent protein, um, uh, what's it called? Threaded fluor fluorescent protein fi uh, fabrics, mm -hmm. essentially making biomaterial out of fluorescent proteins. And they yeah. won this like H&M grand prize. And now they got this like global patent on it. It's, it, it's, it was incredibly um, like, uh, again, formative and, and, uh, and really like honed my, my craft a little more. But regardless of all these, uh, all these whatever minor achievements, no school would consider it. So um, I decided, you know what, um, screw it. Let me try to do my Flowers for Everyone project as a PhD thesis and kind of go through the motions. Mm -hmm. And um, a couple of my professor friends on Twitter said, um, you know what, why not? Let, let's, let's humor this. Let's actually, let's actually do it. We'll go through the motions. We'll have a defense. We'll have a committee. Um, you know, six papers and your thesis, right? <clears throat> And so um, I'm starting to do it, right? Regardless of like academic credit or whatever, I just said, I wanna be a better biologist. And in its purest sense, um, biology with mentorship, which is kind of what grad school is supposed to be about, um, is tried and true uh, to, to becoming a better biologist, to becoming a better yeah. scientist, you know, like working with professors yeah. and getting feedback, um, having deadlines, and then having a way, someone, a group of people to chisel away at the biases and kind of misdirections until yeah. you get to something that's really straightforward, right? right. And then learn from that. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so oh, about two years ago, like one year before COVID, excuse me, I started a um, an initiative called Flowers for Everyone, where yeah, I, I wanted it. to I wanted to document the progress the process of generating um, a plant with a floral phenotype um, from scratch. Right, so like start from the absolute ground up. Like, what do you need to build a lab? What do you what do you need? Uh, what genes you need to assemble? How to assemble them? Essentially, like a diary meets a Julia Child cookbook, um, with all the protocols inside. Right, entirely mm -hmm. open source. Mm -hmm. And um, and then COVID happened, um, and ironically, it was it was as I was about to start testing my final colors for like the first phase. Right, because the idea was to have. Um, four genes that can combinatorially produce uh, many different colors within the color gamut space dictated by those four colors. Well, three mm -hmm. colors, cyan, yellow, magenta, and then melanin for black, right? Mm -hmm. So combining the expression of those four genes, you can essentially uh, produce the subtractive color space, which is um, essentially what printers do. They glob mm -hmm. those the four colors and produce whatever optical apparent color uh, you'd want. And so having students generate synthetic promoters that can like nuancely tune the amount of expression to produce whatever colors they want and then di uh, direct those colors to petals so students can make their own flowers is um, essentially the, the, the overarching goal, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was about to test those, then COVID happened. I got COVID, I blew out my back, I got COVID again. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, um, yeah, these past two years have been crazy, but um, the supply chain issues, um, lingered in the back of my mind for a bit. And uh, I don't remember, it was another conversation with Sung that eventually led to um, the remove the re a challenge to not use antibiotics anymore in molecular biology, in my practice specifically. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I came up with an idea called pea sugar, um, which is pretty simple. And in, in it's already been validated in different parts. It's just hasn't been really made to come together. Um, uh, most cloning strains of E. coli lack the CSC operon, which is a dedicated sucrose met metabolism operon. And there's two genes, CSCA, which is a an invertase that breaks sucrose into glucose and fructose. Mm -hmm. And then CSCB, which is a permease that allows the sucrose to come into the cell. Okay. Um, if your cell lacks those, um, it can't eat sucrose. So if you have a minimal media where the only carbon source is sucrose, they'll starve to death. They physically don't have the machinery. Now, other strains of E. coli do have these genes. And uh, Claudia Vickers in 2014 uh, published a paper on sucrose utilization in E. coli or um, heterologous sucrose utilization in strains that don't have those genes. Um, and then an iGEM team in 2017 uh, tried, uh, tried what my idea is now, uh, but reported that they couldn't generate clones when they removed the, the antibiotic selection genes and replaced them with those sucrose genes. Um, so the, 
so and and I tried it and it worked initially. I saw colonies on the sucrose plate um, um, that are positive for those genes, and no colonies on the ones that don't carry those genes. Okay. Um, and so that that essentially was the proof of concept that maybe instead of having anti antibiotic resistance, we do positive selection and use sucrose genes on a plasmid to retain that plasmid and produce whatever protein you'd like. Um, also, um, antibiotics in the US are easy to come by. You can just order them and they'll ship to you. In many other countries, they're A, frontline antibiotics, and B, you need a prescription or they're highly regulated. Got so it. we, yeah, so you essentially um, inadvertently gatekeep a, a large pro pro um, portion of students that don't have access to hazmat disposal or their schools are low, uh, low budget, so they don't have access to um, the materials themselves. And right. cold chain is expensive, right? Having a, a, a dedicated fridge for your classroom is a rare thing, right? Yeah. So um, sucrose is stable at room temperature. And so this makes sense as just like an accessible <clears throat> educational tool, <clears throat> but also as a, uh, as a means for amateur biologists to explore too, because I'm, right. I'm not forgetting my roots because I still have very much am an amateur biologist. And right. so I want to build tools for my community to allow more people to do biology and not circumvent regulations, but basically remove the things that are, uh, that are worrisome, right? right. Like an antibiotic, um, uh, antibiotic microbial resistance genes. Those, right. uh, those are a huge topic of study, right? And a huge concern. Many of nosocomial infections, people dying from nosocomial infections today um, had a great therapies not 10 years ago for the same bacteria, you know? But right. because of all of this uh, overuse of antibiotics and the presence in, in uh, livestock utilization, um, it's caused a huge problem. And though minor, I don't want to have folks doing amateur biology contribute to that problem, right? right? Especially if this is exploratory. Yeah, sure. so the whole, the, the whole idea is, can you do uh, gene cloning in E. coli uh, with just sugar, no antibiotics, then can you maintain and transform agrobacterium, the main vehicle for plant engineering, using sugar as well? And then ultimately, can you select plants using a different kind of sugar, nanos, right? So all of these, except for the agrobacterium, the E. coli and the, uh, the plant side have been confirmed to work with their respective genes. And there's pressure for those. Um, so bridging everything together, you can have an end-to-end -end plant genetic engineering pipeline with full genetic assembly and all the tools necessary without ever needing herbicides or antibiotics. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and then it'll be open source and distributed for a small fee through, through my Etsy, essentially. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, this sounds awesome. And this was, uh, you, I think you were tweeting that you were thinking about doing this on experiments. So let me know if you want to do that. I'm happy to to um, talk yeah, that. yeah. As but I'm, um, that's a separate conversation. Sure, sure. Of course, of course. Uh, yeah, like as I'm fleshing this out because um, I'm building the railroad track as I'm going, right? Yeah, and I'm trying to, sure. I'm trying to go as slow as possible to try to um, really like zoom out and fill in the literature gaps I have because you know, okay. um, sucrose. I mean, sugar metabolism in bacteria have been so well studied, right? Like the yeah. lac operon that won Monod his Nobel Prize. Um, the uh, that whole system is well understood, and it's a, just a sister chain to the overall hexose metabolism pathway. Um, right. So I have a lot, a lot of catching up to do and a lot of classical microbiology that I don't want to put my foot in my mouth. So I really need to catch up before I say stuff. Um, but, but yeah. But I it mean, seems like that's how you learn. And that's actually how I learned. Cause like, it took me, I, I wrote this book, Zero to Maker. It was like my attempt to get involved with the maker movement. Mm -hmm. I'm not an engineer or a scientist. And so, but I needed a project in order for things to like make sense. And this is why we started the building underwater you know I started this underwater robot project with my friend because right. I just if if I don't have like a project driving it it's very hard for me to um to kind of to to put things in context and to make sense of them so it sounds like that's how you learn too yeah definitely like hands-on learning making mistakes and then um I'm not afraid of 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 like failure and goofing up I'd rather document those especially since it could help other people avoid their mistakes too yeah. um so it's it, I mean it, it's been so so interesting to have um to have a very clear project because before I was just kind of like doing infinite side projects right just like yeah. like one-off curiosities you know leave some projects unfinished come back to them when you're not uh, when you're not bored of them anymore um, but this is like the first time I have a very, very clear research focus um, towards something tangible that can actually help people, right? Um, yeah. And the the helping people part, I never thought I'd uh, I'd get into um, with sin with sincerity because like what the hell do I know as an amateur, right? Um, yeah. But but it it turns out that the uh, the needs of the amateur biologist and the needs of the the formal biologist are slightly different, 
Um, and I'd love to fill the needs uh, of the amateur biologists to help them um, basically build ladders for friends. Because um, right. I'm privileged to have this lab in my home and able to, to run these experiments in the time necessary. So uh, yeah. might as well pay it forward and generate these tools because it is incredibly boring to do, not, not just boring, but like kind of lonesome to just do science by yourself. Right? Yeah. Like the, the collaborations I have with Sung are way more enriching and, um, and entertaining. Like from a hedonic perspective, I have way more fun uh, DIT bio, do it together, than yeah. DIY. You know? Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that, and basically, uh, a bunch of my friends, especially on Facebook, are really interested in in not just like like cheering me on. More importantly, the they're interested in doing the same, right? Me and too. it took me like fif fifteen years of just like hitting my head against the wall to figure this out. And that's not necessary. And one of the main reasons why it took me so long is I had no mentorship whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I made like infinite mistakes that are not necessary. I mean, they've they've shaped me to be way more cautious and way more aware, like physically aware of my 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 hands as I do stuff, but also just like 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 methodology methodologically aware of right. where if I screw up, how can I save it? Right. So it's useful, but I don't want people to go through that. So a lot like the overwhelming majority of my time is spent um, distilling down projects that I've understood well in order to be for it to be teachable, but also reproducible. Right. right. Because if I develop a tool and it only works in my hands, that's kind of useless. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like so no, I think that's great. I, you know, I'd love a, if you could, if you could figure out a way to give me a tour of your lab, that would be really sure. cool. Okay. And also right. yeah. paying like particular mind to like telling me how you got these things and how it was when you started and how you accumulated sure. them. I'm interested in all of it because it's, it, you know, okay. it, the, the tools in the environment are a big part of biology. And sure. I think it's one of the big barriers to um, keeping more, keeping more <laughs> people out. So sure, sure. And so, um, I mean, every piece of equipment here has a story, more or less, yeah. because um, the bulk of them I got secondhand, or I fixed it, or I flipped enough equipment so that I can afford a new version of it, right? Got it. So, all right. Um, so here is my workbench. This is you. Okay. Um, let me zoom out a little bit. Uh, so there's my grow lights. There's two of them. One is just currently used as storage. Um, and under my grow lights, sorry, they're not moving as far. Um, those are my, those are my genetically engineered tobacco plants, producing betalanes. Um, here is the tiniest microwave I could ever find. This one here, uh, yeah, it's a dorm microwave. It's pretty sweet, but I melt all my gels. Um, here is a ridiculous amount of chemicals that uh, normal houses don't necessarily have. Um, let's see. We got uh, some schmancy pipettes uh, that I bought secondhand. Uh, the most fancy for the, thing for the secondhand stuff, you just find it on eBay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Com I mostly companies are going out of business, or labs are getting rid of things. That was... yeah, lab, lab surplus or like deals of um, official sellers through eBay, like just offloading some stuff. Um, yeah, so here's my fancy PCR machine. Um, wow. And that my autoclave back there, that's a dental autoclave, really simple upright one. Um, then here's an Opentrons that fell off a truck. Um, basically, this was our first uh, uh, equipment donation um, from uh, Will at Opentrons, uh, essentially to, uh, to bootstrap some plant biology stuff. And then obviously COVID happened, which was fun. But I can't wait to get more, more work done with that. Um, here's the heart of my lab. That's the laminar flow hood. Um, blows sterile air down through a really thick HEPA filter. Um, it doesn't need to be this like super fancy. I was gonna and, say the, the, yeah, the, the fume hoods are the ones I often see the DIY versions the most yeah. of. Yeah, um, but that's, that's, a, that's great. There's a nano drop over there that I got for 200 bucks. Um, yeah, I, I wish this had a better field of view so you can just get a, a full shot. But um, essentially it's everything necessary to do uh, plant molecular biology. Um, plus, oh, right, one, I guess, important piece of equipment. Um, do you see that espresso machine looking thing right there? Yeah. Um, so that's a gene gun. Uh, that's a JG-1000 uh, Chinese knockoff of the PDS-1000 gene gun um, that people use to transform organisms. Um, as soon as the Biorad patent came out, um, a gene gun is essentially just uh, gold, uh, DNA tied to gold and then shotgunned through a vacuum to, yeah. onto tissue especially plant tissue. 
right? And as soon as if the cells, um, I mean, if the if the particle ruptures some DNA and makes double stand, stranded breaks, there's free floating linear DNA hanging out, and there's a very 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 low probability that they'll actually uh, uh, recombine, yep. right? Um, and so that'll allow me to transform any tissue, and that's actually been my bread and butter. It's paid it for itself like three times over already, because uh, I do consultation work, especially for biolistics. Um, since very few people have this uh, device, and also the amount of experiments that are being offered by uh, essentially like outsourcing competitors, competitors, mm -hmm. um, I undercut them by like an order of magnitude because I'm still mm -hmm. learning with the device. So just mm -hmm. like you send me DNA, I'll give you back ten plants as long as you pay for the APHIS permit to allow it to cross state lines. Got it. Um, yeah. So keeping everything legit, following the NIH guidelines for a BSL one lab. Um, all my waste is autoclaved. Um, I generate no hazmat that can't be autoclaved. I don't work with harsh chemicals, um, uh, frankly, because I don't have a fume hood, so it's not safe to do so. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, and no nothing that's GMO leaves my lab without a permit and proper containment. Yeah, so like the windows are shut here all the time. Uh, and I'm pretty damn hygienic about how I, how I treat the uh, genetically engineered material as well. Got it. Um, yeah, because I'm already in this like gray area where there's no law that says I can, I can or can't do what I'm doing, right? Yeah. So uh, while that law remains gray, I'd rather just follow the NIH guidelines and yeah. and and you know do it to code because I also live in an, an apartment building with people around. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, but your landlord people, has your what does your landlord say? Yeah, no, no, he really likes it. No, he, he thinks it's super, he, it's super interesting, and uh, his son's really into it too. Uh, some of my neighbors down the hall. Um, um, what you call it? One of them was like having some difficulties with science stuff, and I'm just like, oh, let's show you some science. Uh, and then they get super excited. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 an interesting, um, like kind of a momentary niche. Like I don't know how long this will last. So in order to ensure that, do you that, mean that for you, or do you mean that for this um, this for this the way this this, this, this um. On this like semi-regulated kind of gray space for biosafety level one stuff um, in the way, because like it varies state to state and the laws aren't super clear. There's no penal code for a lot of it. So it's mostly for people who take grants, like your grants are threatened if you violate these NIH guidelines. Um, I don't take grants, but I also don't violate the NIH guidelines. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, basically I try, I try to, um, to ensure that that if I teach something, it's as safe as humanly possible within this like gray area. And they also making extra consideration for what an amateur space might be, right? Yeah. Because I want people to do GFP coli. I want people to make a Ruby tobacco um, because it's, it's A, it's educational and B, a lot of our educational infrastructure is severely lacking hands-on lab stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And if the difference between like having biotech experience before getting into college and not is your parents' income, uh, we have a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so developing these tools, um, hoping, hoping with, uh, with Binomica to, to start having conversations with educators and seeing if there's ways to incorporate uh, super low budget, uh, actual hands on biotech stuff um, that isn't, you know, price gouged or isn't like hyper restrictive because it's using some exotic antibiotic or things right. like that. Yeah. Right, right. Um, yeah. So our main focus is, is having conversations with educators, but I'd like this to be a self, you know, an autodidactic process as well. If somebody yeah. wants to learn and they're in an environment that uh, they're resource strapped, you know, like what biology can you do? Right. And so I have a bunch of students from like essentially all over the world, um, like doing small microbiology experiments or doing stuff for their class. And we have meetups every Tuesday night through my pedal smiths group on Facebook. Um, basically, I'm just trying to grow friends. I'm trying to grow people to have the, 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 the competence necessary to, so they can design their own flowers. And then just one day in like 2063, have this like really awesome flower symposium of a bunch of amateurs coming together and just like showing their cool stuff. Yeah. Like, I love that. Yeah. Like uh, ideally, like maybe on a train. That would be awesome. Like imagine the Orient Express, but across the states and that your conference yeah. is on the train. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so Sung and I have got, got a lot of... Uh, of, of ideas of how to make this uh, like larger. But again, our main focus is small, thoughtful science. And we want to lead by example. So before we say anybody can do science, um, where is our science, right? And, yeah. hopefully, and hopefully very soon, it'll be up on BioArchive. We'll have a DOI number. That'll be archived essentially forever. Um, yeah. And then after feedback, hoping to go into a formal journal, right? And the entire thing is single nanopore flow cell of Dinococcus radiophilus. Um, we're exploring some of the plasmid stuff there, but the final thing is an amateur research perspective, right? Um, and that'll be formally part of our title of the of the of the paper, 
right? So it's it's very very specific that we have no experience, and this is a record of our of our experience doing this from scratch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then basically laying down the groundwork for other people who might want to do something similar, or or essentially a hub of laboratory notebooks, so that at the mm -hmm. end of the at end of the year we can be like, here's all the people doing really interesting amateur biology. In case anybody has the really dumb um, uh, misconception or preconception that citizen science and amateur biology have no space in formal academics, right? Mm -hmm. I think we can meaningfully contribute like significantly because there's way more questions than there are grantable, uh, uh, like uh, like that there are funding bodies to offer grants to, mm -hmm. right? There's, I mean, there's, you know, 86% of all eukaryotes on the planet have yet to be discovered, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, ample room for, for us to be part of the conversation. Absolutely, and, and it also, you know, there's two kind of definitions of amateur. One is the, the, the one popular in the United States, which is like second class or not professional. And then the French term, which is the lover of people who yeah. do things, not just for money. They do it yeah. because they're passionate about it. And um, I've tried to make the argument um, that the amateur science is, is, is good for a lot of reasons. Like one is it gets, gets more people involved, but I actually think science would be better off if it had a better amateur orientation. And what I mean by that is the, in like, pop, in like you always hear scientists talking about the public. They're like, oh, the, here's the science and then we need to talk about the public. And I think that's a really like, um, I don't know that that language really helps. I, I think, you know, like the NBA doesn't play basketball for the public. They play basketball for their fans and the orientation of the game is toward people who love it. Right. And and the same is true for films and 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 music. It's it, they make it for the fans, the people who love the thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm actually not convinced that science shouldn't also be for the fans, like for sure. the people who love science, sure. instead of yeah. for the public, like the yeah. lowest common denominator. Definitely, definitely. And I and I think there's a lot of um, of missed opportunities. Um, like, like the way citizen science spawned out of academia as more of like, how can we offload effort onto people who want to participate mm -hmm. in that part participatory science? That also kind of grinds my gears because um, you can't call it science if the people participating don't have a say. If they, mm -hmm. they, don't, they, don't, they don't generate hypotheses, they don't test experiments, they're, they're doing data crunching. And while that's very important, and many, many teams have dedicated data crunchers. They have like people who just do figures. And I get that. I totally get that. I watch Formula One. I know that the guy with the with the uh, with the wrench gun is the is the person who only does the wrench gun stuff. I get it. <laughs> but um, yeah, but but there's this like uh, th there's this missed opportunity in that um, you can generate small questions, right? That maybe ha people haven't considered yet. Or you can generate, basically any knowledge is good knowledge. You can generate that and polish it. And if there's like a pre preprint prep to just kind of like accelerate it, just like what's the catalyst from going from curiosity to scientific rigor, mm -hmm. right? And that jump is incredibly intimidating because not only are you generating uh, this information in a cautious way, people will read it, people will criticize you, right? And if you do something for a hobby that involves criticism, that kind of parrot, that, that juxtaposition can be really abrasive. Right, because you're just mm -hmm. like this is something from the heart. This is something I truly love, and now it's going to get ripped to shreds uh, through a process of peer review, formal or informal. Right, mm -hmm. um, and so so trying to kind of navigate what does the social practice of biological research look like um, has been super rewarding, but still very nebulous. Right, like um, we don't want to remake academia right as it stands because that's a profession, and they have their own their own hierarchy. There's there's a, a whole lot of stake right? A uh, whole lot of skin in the game. And so for folks who want to do this for fun, how do we do long form science? Instead of publish or perish, like maybe you'll do one formal publication in your entire life, but it's a life's worth of work, right? Like it's, it's, it's your uh, contribution to the world as a, as a book, right? Of all the things you've done. Um, that could be meaningful in and of itself, right? And if applied with some rigor and, and, and some reproduction, especially, um, you have the makings of of, of very undeniable proof that amateur biology is not second class biology. Mm -hmm. It's not just for fun, right? It's for fun, but the byproduct is generated knowledge that can be utilized. Um, so yeah, so, so there, there's, a, there's a lot 
I'm thankful that people have missed missed these opportunities because that leaves niches for my nonprofit to to be relevant and not be hyper competitive with other nonprofits who are trying to like, you know, commandeer the 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 educational materials market, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're not trying to generate materials; we're trying to ge generate people who generate knowledge. Yeah, right? totally. So like, the and it's software... the reason that I'm attracted to the project, right? Like it's like the the way you've defined the flowers for everyone. It's, it's something that I read about, and you know, I'm in Seattle, and I'm you know halfway across the country and i i can see the pick the big division and the love and the, the interest and the, the care that you've put into that and it's not like if it was just like an educational product i'd be like okay cool but i wouldn't i wouldn't actually personally be like a, a you know the attracted to it so um so i'm sorry for interrupting i think uh I think it's a, I think it's a good, I think it's an important vision. And um, I think you're right to point out a few things. One is the, the kind of citizen science kind of being co-opted by the academy. Like the, the researchers who just saw this opportunity to gather a bunch of data and also the, the, you know, I don't have anything against the biohackers, like, you know, but I also think like it took the narrative in a direction that I don't think is um, possible, is like necessarily positive um, and productive. And I also think um, the great, the best part about these amateur scenes is when they start to build momentum, they become they actually drive the, they can steer the ship in terms of where the technology is headed. And, you know, like computer science is a really good example. And like, you know, personal computers. I, I spoke recently with Michael Schrage, who wrote this wonderful um, essay for Make Magazine called Kits and Revolutions. And it's about like how uh, technological revolutions and scientific revolutions have this like common theme of this kit building phase. And I think that's something that comes out of um, these amateur scenes more often than not. And um, they can be incredibly generative and actually wind up really steering fields. So, um, you know, I don't, I, I think it's, um, I love the, the idealism and, that you have and I, I, I share it, but I also think it's like worth keeping an eye at, at the, on the outsiders because there's there's really important work to be done there. It's not just like filling in gaps. Like there's there's really important stuff that can be found. Yeah, the um, the the aspect of of outsiders in uh, academia, like like science Twitter, has really opened my eyes as to how academics kind of interact on a on an informal level, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's just like some interesting patterns. Like sure, there's professionalism, but there's also like a lot of human like humanness right a lot of like drama and like silly stuff but also um also a lot of significant concerns and a lot of concerns that i don't think the general public for lack of better words is acutely aware of right like the uh mistreatment and harassment of course there's 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 uh grad students uh pay things like that like, like the logistics of of the ivory tower is something that 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 uh, a lot of uh, a lot of outsiders don't they're not necessarily privy to like I'm, and I'm, I still don't know exactly how everything works and all this, but um, what I have noticed is that at the end of the day, these are these are very capable and very talented, but also very human human beings. And the humanity, the human aspect of science, is something that I think is sorely missing from the depiction of the practice of science. Everything is very sterile. Everything is very uh, scripted in those videos. You know, like people just like staring idyllically into like a flask of of, uh, of algae. Um, and I get that. I get the PR, but that just like it seems so dated. Because it's not, it's not an, that we've, I mean, we have grown in cynicism, but we've also grown in like a need for realism, right? Because everything is mass manufactured and very, very uh, like, pers like the personalized ads phenomenon have really made people very cynical. Mm -hmm. And so when, you, when you're sold as a student as to what a career in the sciences looks like, um, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's very rare to have real talk with, with professional scientists and be like, what does a career like, like that look like? And because I've been like essentially pushed away from that potential career path, temp I guess, temp hopefully temporarily, um, I try to not focus at all on it being a career, right? Like mm -hmm. when people when people approach me for, for 
uh, amateur bio questions or how do I start, the first thing that I frame is that like, this is not to get you a job. This isn't gonna look great on a CV, right? Like this, this, this is for you. Do you want to do this? Like you pick up woodworking, not so you can get into a better woodworking college, you know? Like you pick it up because you like, you like friggin' woodworking, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and oftentimes I get a lot of pushback and some friction because they can't fathom scientific research as a hobby, right? And these are folks asking, how do I start? Which was kind of masquerading under, uh, masquerading under how do I start was really, how do I make a startup? How do I make money off of this? Mm -hmm. And um, my, my critical gripe with this is that if you just play basketball for fun, no one there's pressuring you to go get an MBA contract. Mm -hmm. You know, like very few people who actually pay bas play basketball actually think they're good enough for the MBA to begin with, but also that's not even on their mind. They just like the sport. You're a fan mm -hmm. of the sport. You also like playing it. I'm a fan of science. I also like playing it. You know, like I also like doing the science. I like generating knowledge. I like helping biologists out. Um, it's a very unique high to go from um, how the hell does any of this work to I've helped out several uh, formal biologists do actual real world stuff, mm -hmm. right? And felt like, and not necessarily as equals, but at least as colleagues, which mm -hmm. was something I never thought possible. And if it's possible for me, I'm pretty sure it's possible for a lot of other people. And mm -hmm. this way, instead of the participatory aspect, you put the onus of responsibility kind of in the midway point. Right, because participatory science requires very little effort from the participant and a lot of effort from the organizers to make a sandbox where the data is relevant, but also mistakes are okay. Right, like okay. there's not a lot of pressure. Um, I think while that's important and a good step, I think the lack of, uh, of any forward momentum from that point, like how do you go from participatory scientist to actual scientist, mm -hmm. right? That bridge is not defined because typically people say, go to school. It was like, of course, by all means, if you want a career in the sciences, please go to school and stay in mm -hmm. school. It's mm -hmm. awful out here um, without a degree. Like it's so cold without a degree. Um, but <laughs> but given given that given that that concept, um, having people scientifically literate before they start their project, like do lit review, kind of understand that the, the that science was around before your time, and it and it will exist after you, and you're just participating in the conversation for a moment. Right, mm -hmm. like um, perspective is important. A little bit of science philosophy is important, and I think that's tremendously lacking. Um, I mean, in incredibly empowering tools, um, but lacking from the transitionary point between participatory research and actual research. Mm -hmm. Right. So, like, um, and this is where where my organization kind of is focused on is like, where is this this gap between people who want to do research, who are surrounded by citizen science projects, um, and don't know how to get to the research aspect of it. Right, mm -hmm. because like if if you if you write all your stuff in a blog, your blog dies with you, and it's as if it never happened because there's no archiving, there's mm -hmm. nothing actually storing this for all time. You know, like mm -hmm. thank God for the Wayback Machine, but even then, um, and that's why pushing towards publication, especially now that things like BioArchive exist, which is free, right? They look mm -hmm. like does this look like a sane manuscript of something? Cool. All right, it's on BioArchive, right? Mm -hmm. Like the um, the the initial vetting is lower because the whole point is it's a preprint. Right. Mm -hmm. So embracing the preprint as a potential place where um, that's a lot of peas, um, where uh, amateur biology can thrive, where you get actual feedback from real biologists who are going like, try this hypothesis or how about this? You know, like if people can doom scroll on Twitter, they can probably doom scroll on BioArchive mm -hmm. on a section for amateur biology, you know, mm -hmm. and not in the sense of like, oh, this is second rate, but more of just like we're really looking for constructive criticism. You know, mm -hmm. we're looking for ways to develop into a better biologist. We're not trying to compete with your lab or trying to scoop you for whatever. Chances are whatever uh, an amateur biologist comes up with um, either it hasn't been done before or is so hyper niche and specific and possibly non-grantable that no scientist will waste their time with it. Right? Mm -hmm. And so like there's so many op like questions that remain open and unanswered because the hot topic du jour that's grantable is no longer this, you know. Mm -hmm. So like revisiting old papers, that's, that's, I love doing that. Like um, I made the mini spec system so I can revisit Jacques Manaud's PhD thesis from 1942. So like while he was shooting Nazis during the day, he was spinning poop bacteria to try to understand how it grows, right? Um, and notice that if you use two different uh, sugars, you get two growth curves, right? You measure every hour and you get a curve. But if you, if you use two different, two specific kinds of sugars, it, it uses the first one first and then the mm -hmm. second one. So you have two growth curves and you have, mm -hmm. a, you have a measurable biological phenomena, which is directly coupled with what you put in, right? Mm -hmm. which, 
And so like behind me, you see these like little bottles over here. Um, those are, it's a media library of just like little steps of calcium and magnesium and, and different salts and doing growth curves to try to kind of get a feel for what's going on, right? right? All while replicating his like seminal PhD thesis, which everyone cites, but not everyone speaks French. So how did you read it? Hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, so I was like trying to teach myself reading French uh, to just be able to uh, to kind of parse it so I can replicate it, right? And yeah. and that and it's it's so exciting to like take essentially um, not to glorify Nobel Prize but uh, Nobel Prize winning work and be mm -hmm. able to replicate it um, for for pennies, right? Mm -hmm. With modern tech like Arduinos and some electronics, like the electrical en en uh, engineering side of of the maker movement has been the biggest benefit to everyone, and I'm I'm so mad that people don't recognize it for, for it's so uh, underrated. It really so is underrated. because you can learn to be to be competent in electrical engineering to do PCB design in like a year's time of auto free autodidactic learning. You know, mm -hmm. just like you could teach yourself to do really amazing stuff. And you know, like uh, one of my heroes, Dave Jones from the EEV blog, um, I like cut my teeth on his videos. You know, like I taught myself how to do electrical engineering through his videos and then through his forum. Right. So there's like there's this like really um, welcoming and embracing community of electrical engineer, like veterans in the trenches doing fundamental Fridays going, what is a capacitor? They don't have to, but they want to do this, you know, and there's like, there's such a, there's such a thriving community of like mutual education. But when it comes to biological research, there's, there's so much impediment, right? And a lot of them are, are like regulations for good reason. But then right. there, there are also um, caveats, like, does everything need to be this expensive? Do we need all of this fancy equipment? Like there's this conflation that molecular biology requires crazy equipment. I mean, how did we do molecular biology like 50 years ago, you know, mm -hmm. or even a hundred years ago, right? And it's not like, oh, those questions were answered. I'm like, you sure? Because those yeah. questions were answered in the models that, well, that what, uh, what was then now have become models, but those are in the models. What if you'd like, you know, stick your leg out into the boon into the boonies a little bit and grab a microbe that is semi-domesticated, safe, mm -hmm. you know, within BSL-1, not a human pathogen, yeah. but um, no one has really messed with it. Or like uh, the more controversial thing is to to go out and find microbes, right? Yeah. And so um, and that's so that's where things get tricky, right? Because you're supposed to treat an unknown microbe as a pathogen by just just to be safe, right? Right. So uh, what kind of media formulation will will um, avoid certain corners of the biological kingdom that might be uh, intrinsically pathogenic, right? right. Um, because exploration is risky. I mean, you know, stuff, uh, some of the stuff is quote unquote pioneering, but not all the pioneers survived westward expansion, you know? So I don't want uh, an amateur biologist to get hurt w through their excitement of exploring the natural world, because there's mm -hmm. plenty of things out there that'll bite you. But there's also mm -hmm. many, many, many things that won't, right? Yeah. So so um, one, one of the more uh, controversial, but interesting philosophical explorations is how can we um how can we gauge a biological exploration as a risk factor and where does acceptable risk lie for the amateur like where is the where's the, the wall where you should not go past right with good reason you know like where has it become unsafe and how can we happily stay well well away from the wall but still with enough um like leeway to actually explore you know because mm -hmm. like the i think it was like the ask guardians the 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 microbes that were discovered not too long ago um, that was like another branch of the tree of life was discovered by a, by a student swabbing a leaf on their hike, right? Like, hmm. what, is the, what is the difference between that student swabbing a leaf and a middle schooler swabbing a leaf, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, yeah. The, it's the support system, it's the infrastructure, but do you really yeah. need fancy stuff to explore? I don't think so, right? And so uh, a lot of what we're doing is trying to focus on how can we uh, safely explore and actually meaningfully contribute at the same time. You know, because yeah. like people are like, there's an old adage saying that uh, born uh, too late to explore the world, born too soon to explore the cosmos. Mm -hmm. But part, part of my French, that's a load of bullshit. There's like an actual cosmos underneath your feet of, mm -hmm. of microbes that have never been seen before. And like, there's just still so much we don't know. We don't know that like, mm -hmm. it would kind of be irresponsible to limit educational practices of exploration based off of this like, uh, not really well-founded sense of risk, right? right? Like people eat bread and then it's kind of moldy, right? And some people yeah. have lost their face to bread mold. Other people have not, right? Yeah. Um, we have super dangerous chemicals underneath our sink, right? Things yeah. that if you mix poorly will generate chlorine gas and you'll die, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so we have acceptable risks, but for some reason we have a cultural preconception that biology, which is aiming towards like 
the sterile compartmentalization of these living organisms is somehow inherently more risky because you have more control. What? Yeah. Like that, that part, that, that part didn't really resonate um, well with me. And I always found that curious. Yeah. So basically framing it as saying like, there are dangerous things in your home. Yes. Let's not dwell on that. And let's just do good laboratory practices, mm -hmm. right? Let's be safe. Let's treat things with as much care as we can, but more importantly, yeah. treat things with respect. Right. I think mi microbiological respect is probably one thing that I would love to, to, to like drive the message home into like fellow amateur biologists is that we should have respect for the natural world, not fear or, or, or reckless abandon, but respect. And yeah. somewhere in there is like a sandbox we can play in. Absolutely. I think that's like the, you know, the, other than some like high profile, like biohacker stunts, like I think what you'll see is that it's a profoundly responsible community. And I think sure. there's been like nature opinions about this. Like you want to talk about ethics, that's, you know, talk to the community biologists because they're, they're way ahead on this um, because they do interface with people and they've been and thinking we also about have, this. Yeah, and we have a lot to lose too. A tremendous right, amount exactly. to lose. Yeah, it's well if put. one person messes it up and there's a, uh, there's a career politician that wants to like make, make a name for themselves by regulating this, um, there's very little we can stop, or that we yeah. can do to stop this. You know, if we gang, to, gang up together and like form a formal petition and stuff, we don't have enough pull. That's why I think showcasing that amateur biology is, is worthwhile and worth considering to formal academics could be helpful because that could yeah. be uh, a professional vouching of going like, yeah, yeah this makes sense. Hey, this, is, this, this is intrinsically, or this is safe enough. Yeah. Or this is worth pursuing, you know. There, there's um, no DIY bio lobby. Yeah, and I don't think there should be because it's such a it's such a personal exploration. It's such a per yeah. for me like this this yeah. part in the romantics, but like yeah, yeah. Um, like like chilling in my lab at like three in the morning by myself just doing stuff. Um, uh, there's something really meditative about it, but also highly personal. Like hobbies mm -hmm. are so so deeply personal, and to like make it political. Um, something where the entire world is politicized. Hopefully, hopefully finding a refuge. In, in this aspect of science, because science is political, right? Especially right. formal science is political totally. for sure. Um, and this act of, of enabling others could be seen as a form of activism, sure. Yeah. But I don't want to frame it as like stick it to the man or fuck the system, pardon my French. Um, but there's, but rather than like, there's an entire world to explore and we're too busy like complaining about stuff on Twitter, right? Yeah, like, yeah. And, and just like frame frame it through a different lens where that lens is is excited optimism rather than just like doom saying that like yeah. you shouldn't do this because you'll make a bsl4 critter yeah, yeah. you know yeah yeah well that's awesome I, look you've been really generous with your time and your ideas and um i i hope this is just the beginning i hope we get to to keep having this conversation and, and following along with your work um and uh, I, I really appreciate it. I'm glad you, I'm glad we had the time to talk. Yeah, me too. Me too. Thank, thanks so much for having me. This was uh, um, also just every time I, I talk to people about stuff I'm doing, it helps me reframe and get an idea of, of how to better phrase some things. Sure. Right? Cause like this type of dialogue gives me a lot of feedback too. So I actually yeah. find it really helpful. So yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that's the thing that, um, that, I mean, that's the reason I'm doing this whole podcast is not, I don't have zillions of followers you know, it's, it's for the conversations and to build a relationship sure. with folks. Um, well, cool. Let's do it again. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thanks so much. David.